we sat down and Agnes Nixon and I had a conversation that must have lasted about at least three hours. I was thrilled because I realized that as the staff writer, she was allowing me to have input into how this character was going to be handled. And I went into everything that I had gone into with other people about the box in which I worked so that it would all be motivated in terms of what... Uh, and years later, in 1988, when she was uh, 20 years into the future, when she was honored by the Museum of Broadcasting, she would say in so many words in the first draft of her uh, uh, presentation to the broad... She said, and, uh, she said it was practically a collaboration because we learned, she, I learned so much from her, she practically wrote the part herself. So the thing that was so great about that storyline was it not only had all the mechanics and what have you to, to make it, it also had a, le a level of authenticity because she went into everything with me. And she also let me know how, who she was in terms of the woman how she got to be who she was in terms of knowing how to write this. Agnes Nixon was the star pupil of the woman who had invented the soap opera, i.e. Erna Phillips. Phillips. Mm -hmm. That's how she knew the formula. And she went into the formula. There's a very specific formula for soap operas that is entirely different from anything else. In the first place, because they have come on during the day and they're targeted to women, they are, women are more important in soap operas than men are. In the evening, it's Matt Damon, uh, Christian Bale, uh, Tom Cruise, Denzel Washington, the men of the ball game most of the time, and the woman's there for the ride, and they're there forever at 100, they're still playing the role, and the latest one is 16 years old, not playing opposite them, and you know how that goes. Anyway, this is what a, how a soap opera differs entirely, because it's targeted to women, and also because it is meant to last not for the 10 years of a Dallas or a dynasty, but for decades. Guiding light from the time, and Erna Phillips, this was guiding light, guiding light from the time it started in radio until it ended in television, lasted for, guess what, 72 years. That's how long it lasted. Uh, it may be 71 or 73, but it's up there, okay? Um, this is the formula. And she sat down and she told it to me exactly the way it's supposed to work. You take a handful of families, just like she had taken the Wolicks, the Greys, the Seagulls, and the Lords. You take a, you call them temple characters. That's just what they do. They hold up the tent. They're going to be there forever. And I'm going to use General Hospital as the example because that's the one that still exists and everybody knows those characters. This is what the theory is. Say you have a woman who starts looking at General Hospital when she's in college, you know, her, when she has a, her lunch hour, she starts looking at General Hospital. She goes out into the workforce, she forgets it. She uh, gets, uh, well, engaged, she gets married, she gets pregnant, she comes home, she hasn't been home. She decides she wants to be a mother, full-time mother. And uh, so she stays, uh, she, uh, at least until the kid's ready to go to school, and then she'll start thinking about getting back into the... She hasn't looked at the damn thing for seven years. She turns it on. She turns on General Hospital. There's Emily McLaughlin. There's John Berardino. There's Rachel Ames. That's who was there when she started looking a long time ago. That's who she's going to see when she comes back. They're the hook that grabs you. No matter what you have done or for how long, when you go back there, these people are going to be kept from the moment they open the show to the day they die or the show dies till death do us part. That's what a tentpole character is. And the whole point is, just like you don't shoot your mother when she passes 40, 
People will stick with you if you're somebody they get to know like a neighbor or they will, that's why they will hire. You can have a viable career in soaps if you were in your 80s and your 90s, like Jeannie Cooper, like Helen Wagner, like uh, 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 Francis Reed. All of them. Mm -hmm. Forever. You're there forever till death do you part because it works every time. You grab the, the tentpole people grab them on that first snap on and they'll say, oh, look how interesting. She's not, she's, she's not married to him anymore. She's married to so and so. Oh my. And they get involved with the new people. But that's what they do. You have your tentpole ca and the transient characters that come in with the new faces and the fresh faces and they interface and differently and what have you. But that's how the thing lasts. And she explained that to me, and in the course of explaining it to me, seemed, I thought, to infer that now that Lillian and I were the Gray family, we were tentpole characters who were going to be there for the rest of the ride. Because once it was clear that I was black, she went marching into battle, waving the flag of the equal opportunity employer. She said, I am, that's when she told the world that I am creating the first black star in the history of daytime. I'm giving this woman the same opportunity that my white characters are gonna get and she's gonna have the same history and arc of whatever and so, and it is on the basis of the belief of media, not just my belief, but the belief of the press, the public, and the history books, that what she meant was that I was going to be there for the full length of the ride with the same kind of uh, a career a thing as her white stars. And that's what I came away from the thing believing that that's what Agnes Nixon believed, but I had no idea who Agnes was.